All right, so let's get into it today. We're gonna dive into Bitcoin, where the economy is going, and also take a look at how some of the triggers that may be flowing out as we start to lead into the summer, all aligning with both inflation, where the Fed may go with interest rates, and all of the cascading effects of what we've been doing over the last year. We're gonna talk about that and dive a little deeper for you guys. I think you're gonna like this one. My name is Paul Barron, welcome back into Tech Path. Joining me today is Mr. James Lavish, who is one of the co-managers over at the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. Great to have you on the show. No, thank you for having me, Paul. Happy to be here. Yeah. So, James, let's get into I've heard a lot of podcasts. Uh, it kind of was what drew us to some of your narrative. So I thought this would be a good opportunity for us to talk with you, share it with our audience, kind of dive a little deeper. I want to just kick off here with your Twitter page. And this was a, a pretty good thread. This goes all the way back to March 15th. So you were a little bit uh, ahead of the game here. I'm gonna zoom in on that. By the way, if you guys aren't following James, make sure and catch him up right there at James Lavish over on Twitter. Um, but let's get into some of the things. You hit on this first thing, sudden onset of bank uh, insolvency, credit risk, seems good time to peak uh, at the treasury. Uh, financial position takes this debt temperature, so to speak. Um, and this is a long but really important one. So saddle up and settle in. So a good tweet back in March, pretty much you were ready for it. And uh, and then sure enough, we started seeing bank uh, insolvency start to occur. You had a, a pretty good thread here uh, that really started to pique my interest. And I wanted to hit on a couple of these and get some comments from you. Uh, GDP expected to stop growing uh, this year, start growing again by next year uh, or second half of 23. Uh, CBO uh, inflation remaining at about two through 24. Uh, maybe 2% by 2026. And then unemployment, this was the one that I was uh, intrigued with, uh, projected to increase to 5.1. With what we've seen in the job numbers here recently, would you would you feel like that is still a solid number uh, by what you're thinking by the end of this year, 2023? Uh, going yeah, to so, these, so let's, let's uh, first clear up uh, exactly where those numbers came from. Yep. So what I did was the, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, who does the budgeting for the, the c Congress and for the Treasury to see and to give them insight into to, you know, where they think expenses are going uh, and kind of what their budget should look like. These are numbers that come from them. So they put this report out periodically. I did a thread way back when, and I think it was in August, um, about, the same, uh, about the same subject. And the problem is the debt spiral. I mean, that's that's ultimately what we're talking about here is how there we we just spend too much money and we and the, our our income, which is really just the uh, the government, uh, you know, taking taxes. That's that's the uh, tax income for the government. They don't match up. But going to what you're talking about, they put these projections out and yeah, they they're rosy. They were very optimistic. And that's kind of what I was hitting on in that thread is that I think they're too optimistic and the the budget office is missing some marks here. Um, so as far as the 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 unemployment rate is, is concerned, one of the things we keep hearing the Fed talk about is, hey, look, the economy is strong. Unemployment is still low. It's still historically right. low. The economy is strong. We're not seeing any uh, indications of so the Fed. Had, they're kind of pulling all their levers. You know, they're tightening the the access to capital and that's quantitative tightening. Uh, and then they've raised interest rates, skyrocketed interest rates. Um, so I, I did a uh, I, I did a post, or um, and I wrote an article about this. I, I read a newsletter that that talks about these things and simplifies them. But one of the things that we that I looked at when I recently looked at the unemployment situation was um, unemployment will start to tick up a little bit, but it really doesn't spike until we're, we're in that recession, and then right. unemployment spikes. And so mm -hmm. we're not seeing that. We're not going to see it until it's too late. And that's the problem with the Fed's policy and the Fed's approach is they're always looking in the rearview mirror, looking for signs of recession, looking for signs of, of that economic tightening and pullback. And, it, and often it's just too late. And so in this current cycle, what concerns me, Paul, is that the Fed has tightened so rapidly and on a percentage wise, so much be, because we started at ZERP, zero interest rate policy, which we've had for a, for a long time, many years since the financial, great financial crisis. And, and we only are. James, so rapidly. 
you. Uh, hey, James, you, we may you have froze the right there. That James, you froze am right I there. Here? Yeah. Hang on one second. Let that latency pick up and then pick it up right there where you can. And we'll clip that for you. On that, on that right. thought well, you were going into. Yeah. So the, the issue here is that the Fed raised rates at a rocket pace, right? They, they raised rates from ZERP, zero interest rate policy, which we had for a long time since the, the financial crisis, the great financial crisis until now. And they raised them so rapidly on a percentage basis. They were down at, at, at a quarter percent and now they're up over 5%. Mm -hmm. And so we're not able to see the effects of that tightening yet on the economy. We're just now seeing things that are happening in the credit sphere that indicate that that tightening is going to have a, a major impact to the economy. And that's what we're seeing in the regional banks and for a number of reasons. And that's those are interesting that are now they're, they're evolving credit risks. Yeah. This further in this thread, also around that mid-March area, you brought in this right here. Here's the thing. CBO knows it's publishing a few charts with budgets like this one showing the growing deficit. And then right underneath it, and then there's this little gem they also put out. Uh, uh, Houston, are you there? Um, so again, <laughs> showing some pretty, uh, some pretty interesting uh, data points that when you look at this, this does not spell uh, greatness for an economy that could come out of a recession that we're getting ready to go into because that that really is where you're going to start to see wealth being made many people will say hey go invest during recessions wealth will flip on that on the other side what you're showing here could be trouble for quite some time and really kind of constrict the opportunity to make money on the other side of these uh types of you know economic setbacks what do you think could change that in any near future uh for us to be looking at down the road well, well that math is the math that's not going to change. And that's why yeah. I wrote about this. We're, we're, we are in a debt spiral, Paul. There's, there's no way out. We've gotten to the point where our deficit is expanding every single year faster than our GDP, right? So, and the problem is we can't make that up. It's like if you have a, if you're a, a single parent, this is what I tell people. If you're a single parent and you've got a credit card debt, and you're just trying to pay it off, but you can't right really get there. You've got two jobs, you've got kids, you've got uh, you've got to pay for your your mandatory expenses, which is is your house, your your mortgage or rent, your car payment, so you can get right. back and forth to work, gas, food. You can't change those, and so you take out another credit card to pay off the last one, or to mm -hmm. just have access to capital. And we keep doing that, and so. As you know, and uh, I've seen you talk about this with other guests, is that we are right now, and even since I posted that, we we've seen the first half numbers from from right. uh, to 2023, and we're we're at such a large deficit that we're having to borrow more every single every single month in order to mm -hmm. make up that deficit. So the answer is there is no way out except one way, which is massive money printing massive inflation. That's the only way yeah. out. Yeah. Yeah. So this gets, uh, this gets a bit dystopian because if we continue to see these kinds of scenarios, and, and I think the, the key here is uh, with enough people now on, whether you think about macro finance, whether it's on YouTube or podcast, a lot of analysts are coming to the same conclusions here, and it's not anything that's brilliant science. It's just looking at the core math trajectories that exist. Yeah, right. and, and, and with that being the case, I mean, the reality is, what can the U.S. really do to help offset this or possibly kick the can down the road? Because that might be the other scenario that plays into this, is yeah. this could be a 20-year or a 50-year. I had Breedlove on the other day. He and I got into this about where that where that distant future might come or does it approach us much quicker? What are your thoughts? Yeah, so Robert and I talked about this in Jackson Hole a, a number of weeks ago. And, you know, um, well, th the the issue is that it, it, it's just growing so rapidly, right? So what are the three things you can do as a government? And we're right up against the debt ceiling again, right? right. So we're going, through this whole pro we're going through this whole process again. And it, it's a big show, it's all theater, but what you can, you can have austerity, right? You, which we've seen in Greece and Spain and Italy and, and back in the uh, great financial crisis, you, that's one thing, you can cut expenses. Well, yeah. that's political suicide, right? To cut not entitlements, to cut social security, yeah. to cut Medicaid, that's not gonna happen. 
So that's one thing. The second thing you could do is raise taxes. But when you raise taxes, then you disincentivize productivity, right? And so, and you, and you disincentivize, and you actually take money away from companies that they would other, otherwise use for reinvestment into their products, their services, right? To expand their, their footprint. And so in, in essence, in the end, it winds up having the same effect where if you, if you raise taxes, you shrink GDP ultimately. So that's the second yeah. thing you can do. Yeah. The third thing you could do is you could print more bonds, right? Yeah. Which is what we yeah. do to close that gap. But then when you do that, which is what you're getting at, is how, do you, how long can you kick that can down the road? Right. Well, you, you need higher inflation in order to have a negative real rate of return. So what I mean by that is that you need GDP to grow at a faster rate nominally, right, than the interest on your debt, okay? So that means you need, you need GDP or inflation to be higher than the interest on the debt, which means that you have a negative real rate of return, right? So they, that's what they're looking to do. Now, the question is, how bad does inflation get? We keep hearing Powell talk about it on every single every single press conference, every single presser he has. He, he says, we need to get inflation back to 2%. Well, that's an optic for the Fed, right? They want us to believe that inflation is down around 2%. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been. We can see it in our goods and services that we buy every day, that you go out to the grocery store, it is absolutely 20% higher than it was last year. Yet they're saying that inflation was 5% or 4.9%. It's not real. They 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 move those numbers around, but the what what they need to do is have that inflation higher. So how do they do that? Well, with that debt so great and that debt service so great, that number, they're going to eventually going to have to step in and print money. And going back to Powell's pressers and what he talks about is he says every single time he he gets up there, he makes he he reiterates and makes a point that look. We cannot let inflation get out of control. We have to contain it. And we're basically, we're telling you we're going to drive this economy into contraction, a recession, right? And so when they do that, they, they know, and he has said that they have tools to deal with that problem, right? But they don't have tools to deal with hyperinflation. So they're boxed into a corner. And what they'll do is they will drive this economy into a recession, and then they'll come back out with QE. And that's the yeah. QE infinity yeah. that everybody talks about, yeah. right? And so to, to answer your original question, when does this happen? I believe this happens in the next two years. Within this, this cycle, we start to see a, a major breakdown in the economy where the, the Fed has to step in and do multiples of QE than they did even last time, which was massive. And so yeah. Yeah. that's where the inflation comes roaring back in. And I don't know if it's 10%, 15%, 20%, but it is not going to be 4% inflation for the foreseeable future. It's going to be how, much higher. How do you think they can continue to really kind of um, do the ping pong ball game? You know, put it under one cup, slide it under the other. You don't yeah. really know what's, what's happening uh, with inflation right now before not only the you the american public but also the global constituents around the world start to say okay we see the writing on the wall uh we see de-dollarization coming and we see a potential here as an opportunity you're already seeing it in the brics nations we're going to see it more where they say okay well let's mm -hmm. just dislodge away from uh the u.s dollar as our capital front and move into some other areas i mean do you think that also plays into it as a lead up or do you think that happens after we started. We start to really see the QE pressure coming in. Yeah, that's a good question. I think. Uh, well, it's all interconnected, right? So what we're seeing BRICS nations: Brazil, Russia, India, China, uh, South Africa. They're trying to pull away from the, that dollar hegemony, right? So they right. they have said they need to pull away from the the stranglehold that the U.S. Treasury basically has on the world. If you if you want to deal in energy. For since 1971, you you've literally had to do it with U.S. dollars, which means that you need U.S. Treasuries in your own Treasury as reserves in order to mm -hmm. use those to have access to dollars to buy your your energy. But they want to move away from that for a lot of reasons. You know, one of them is that we 
we demonstrate to the world that if you're on the fringe, if you're not one of our allies, we could just turn off your treasuries and you don't have right. access to them. We did that to Russia. That was a mistake in my, my, my mind, you know, in my Huge. opinion. However, so what happens is as they're trying to pull away, the thing is, Paul, they, they, the BRICS nations, as much as they want to have their own reserve currency, there's nothing there that, that can yet rival the treasury. If you look at the U.S. dollar, and it has been going down in uh, usage in, over the last 10, 12 years, it's gone from 69 or 70 percent down to 59 percent. But there's nothing even close to the U.S. dollar. And that's really the most important thing here. The U.S. dollar, I don't believe, will, will lose the global reserve currency status. But I do believe, getting to your point, that we will see the rise of additional global reserve currency or global reserve assets. And particularly the one that I see that wins out is Bitcoin. Ultimately, between now and then, I believe that the BRICS nations will lean on gold as a reserve asset that they can somehow have right. audits to right. that they can somehow deliver to each other in these massive transactions of energy and that's really what they're getting at and does that hurt the u.s treasury absolutely it crowds out that 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 marginal buyer those balance sheets right so we're already seeing these these major nations pull back of their buying of the treasuries right so if you crowd out other balance sheets, and you have to and you have to issue so many treasuries to deal with this massive deficit. Well, who's going to buy those? Mm. The U.S. The U.S. Fed is going to have to buy them. The Treasury is going to print money at the Fed. The Fed will have the the major banks buy them, and then they'll buy it from them, and they'll and they'll monetize the debt just like they did back in 2020. It's it is the same game plan, except it's going to be much larger. That's yeah. the, that's where the inflation really comes in. And that's where the problem with the treasury comes in. And so that that's what we're looking at. So with your with your fund, uh, the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund, um, and this is you know kind of a leading question because I do these weekend, uh, you know, executive retreats, usually high net worth individuals, business owners, mainly just teaching them about the technology of blockchain, Bitcoin in general, it's always the topic, but we get into self, you know, self custody, how that works. They learn about it for the first time. A lot of light bulbs come on in the room when we do those. Mm -hmm. When you're out there talking with business owners, high net worth individual family offices, et cetera, and they're starting to say, all right, we see the capital flight moving out of traditional banks, moving over here into money markets or other potential assets, even gold, possibly some of that reserve now going into Bitcoin. I know a lot of people that have started to do that. And, and of the crypto crowd, it's mostly been just the crypto crowd moving more of their dollar assets into uh, crypto, which we've seen you know, running mm -hmm. Bitcoin up to 30K. But when you look at this um, and also the QE that's coming, is there, I mean, because timing is going to be everything with this. If, yeah. if you're in the wrong yeah. place at the wrong time, and you're going to take a full frontal on your liquid assets. <laughs> this is not yeah. going to look good. Where yeah. do you think that plays out? Do you think this is a 2024 scenario or a 25 scenario after? No, the I think we start. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that um, if you look at, if you just look at historics and just the, like we said, how quickly they, the Fed raised interest rates, right? And you look back at the, uh, and one of the key indicators that I watch is the, uh, is the, the, the spreads between the two-year and the 10-year U.S. Treasury and the three-month and the 10-year U.S. Treasury. Okay. And those have been negative for a while now. And, uh, and so typically, you'll have that inversion, right, that, that yield curve inversion that will occur about nine to 18 months prior to the, the onset of a recession. And so I'm expecting that this recession will start to hit in earnest at late this year. And so yeah. what we'll see yeah. is, like you just said, we'll see, we'll see a drop off of those risk assets and because the investors will need liquidity they will be moving out of risk assets. And so I believe that we will see that and that will produce the opportunity. So if you have some cash or some powder on the sidelines, 
then you'll be able to take advantage of that opportunity. And so things like gold and silver and Bitcoin, I think they'll all draw down along with every other asset that's out there because what happens? You know, Paul, what happens when we have a market shock? Everything correlates to one. They all come together and they all correlate to one and they all sell off. You You have your risk manager that walks onto the the trading floor and you've got your hedge fund manager, your CIO, and they just walk out there. And as, as that panic starts to, to take a grip on the market, they just walk in and say, sell 20% of everything. I don't care what it is. We need capital. We need cash. And we're going to get ahead of this. So if we do have margin calls in other areas of our portfolio, we're not scrambling to sell those assets in order to meet those calls. And that's just, that's just reality of what happened. Yeah. So, yeah. so I do, yeah. So I think that it happens later this year and that produces an opportunity. And if you have capital ready, you're going to be there to take advantage of the opportunity you just, you just talked about. Yeah. It's going to be huge. Uh, this, to me, this goes back into where will wealth is truly built is in these time zones. But again, it's all timing and being able to be at the right place, at the right window, uh, throughout that. I want to look at one other, um, indicator here that could be flowing into this came over from, I think, you know, Greg Foss over there. We've had Foss on mm-hmm. several times and he kind of hits it right here with the CDS spreads. Uh, credit risk looks like it's now an emerging market. You can kind of see this, you look at that and then you see what Alf said. You know, we've had Macro Alf on our show. When credit crunch is going to really hit, don't know, man, but we're looking at the worst conditions to buy houses in 40 plus years. You tell me. A lot of indicators right now. And I think finally we're getting to that point in um, maybe in the cycle of this run uh, with the Fed tightening and also um, us seeing interest rates, real risk interest rates uh, continue to grow at a very fast rate. The credit crunch is probably going to be a very tight window, whether that's six months, eight months, 10 months, that will literally push us right over the edge. That to me is going to be, where does that play out? Do you feel this, how far and how deep is that cut going to be on credit, which is going to affect all business, including jobs, commercial real estate, you know the the numbers. Where do you think that um, plays into it? It's a good question. Uh, you know, uh, the, the CDS, that CDS spread is a particular thing that has to do with the debt, uh, the, the debt limit. And mm-hmm. uh, Greg and I actually talked about it yesterday on the phone. And that's uh, that I, I believe that's the uh, quote of a, of a one year uh, CDS right. swap, which typically you, you quote the five years when you're worried about a, a true default of, of a uh, sovereign debt. But What's, what's significant about that is it's just saying that that the market expects for us to, uh, I mean, it, it, there's a very high uh, chance that we trip that debt limit. That's what that is saying. And there's some, there's some uh, different trades that go on with that. But uh, so, you know, what, what happens here, though, is as, as the problem that, we're, that I'm expecting and, and what, I'm, what I'm concerned about is that we don't kind of just slide into recession like uh, other recessions that we've seen, these soft landings. Yeah. I, I just don't believe that we're going to have a soft landing. The issue is that we have produced, there's so much leverage in the system right now, Paul. There's so much leverage. There's so much debt out there. There's And people are living on credit. You're seeing the credit card uh, balances rise for uh, lower income and mid-income people. You're And then you're seeing the not just the credit card the balances rise. But then the cost of those balances every single month, because those rates have just been ratcheted all the way up to the top tier, right? So that's a problem. And then we're seeing the the distra- there's more distressed debt, and, and every single day there's there are more corporate bonds that go into distress. And what is that? It's when a company can't pay the the interest on its debt; it becomes distressed. And so we're seeing higher higher levels of distressed debt. And though and when that debt when that debt starts to fall out and they go, these companies go bankrupt, well, that's loss of jobs, loss of income. And so, and that GDP goes lower. It, you start this spiral. But the, what I'm concerned about, what I'm most concerned about is that we have a true credit event. And so what we saw last month with, uh, with the banks and with SVB, we saw that there's a great risk that these banks are undercapitalized. These banks right. are not prepared for what we could see on the on the very near horizon, which is the commercial real estate issue that's popping up. Right. Mm-hmm. So 
my concern is that we don't stair step down into this, but we have a credit event that takes us immediately into a drawdown. And that's what, that's what worries me because of all the leverage. Well, and that's, those are the scary ones because you don't know where it's going to stop and you get panic selling, you get all this right. caution in the streets. And then a lot of scenarios that initiate bank runs and things of that nature. We talked to Darius Dale yesterday and he and I got on this whole topic around bank walks, you know, which is just this slow evacuation of evacuation of uh, assets and mostly liquid capital moving into some of these other areas, such as money markets and so on. Um, right. I was looking at the Bitcoin and the chart. larger banks, yeah, and the exactly. larger banks, yeah. yeah. Well, for sure, I was looking at the Bitcoin chart, and uh, I'm looking here. This was goes back to May fifth. And the drawdown here mm. so far has been 11%, okay? You yep. think about Bitcoin correcting some here. We, we continue to track mostly market sentiment. That's one of our, you know, kind of our, mm -hmm. our little uh, bags of what we do. Uh, we've seen the, the market sentiment continuing to fall just a little bit uh, with Bitcoin. Uh, more downturn again this week uh, with the continued daily closes uh, lower. Where do you think this stops on Bitcoin? Do you think this is something that takes us into 25K or further? At oh, least on this short it, run. On this short run, I mean, look, what now what you're seeing, Paul, is that I think Bitcoin got ahead of itself. It was up like 80% for the year. Uh, right. And and right. so what what look, Bitcoin is is kind of straddling between two barbells, right? So it's got it's the it's been the leading risk on asset for a long time, where it leads like the FANG stocks or anything right. that is a store of value. So it, it it expecting the Fed to uh to to pivot, it, it's been it's been that kind of leading indicator, right? So that's one side of the barbell. This the other side of the barbell is with the banking crisis, we're seeing that it's now becoming something. And I've had people talk to me about this for the first time ever that people are asking, hey, tell me about this Bitcoin, because I'm a little bit worried that I can't get my, mon my money from the bank. Mm -hmm. Well, so it becomes this, this, this uh, asset that can't be seized, that can't be frozen, that can't just be liquidated by an irresponsible bank. And so that we're seeing both of those. And so Bitcoin kind of, uh, it, it, it benefited from both of those scenarios in the past month. And I think it just got ahead of itself. Um, but be quite honest, this could easily go lower. Uh, and now we're seeing reports this morning and the, the Michigan sentiment, and you can only put so much value on these, these uh, surveys, but it is an indicator that we're, people are expecting stagflation. And so when you see right. inflation still, it's just hanging here, right? Inflation is hanging here. And we've we've depleted our our uh, SPR, so it's not like we have extra energy that's uh, and extra oil to you know dump into the the economy in order to keep energy prices down. The inflation has been sticky, really sticky, and so the problem is that when you see inflation still remain high, right? But you have the producers pulling back on their production and their and then their inventories. Then you're getting into something that's going to that that really becomes stagflation. It's just a pass through. Yeah. The cost of capital has risen so much that this is just passing through to the consumers. Yet they're running up their credit cards and they're not going to be be able to pay for these things. And so that stagflation scenario is what is concerning investors today. And that's what I, I believe is what is hitting assets like Bitcoin and gold is because people are expecting. That uh, that stagflation to be a painful period, and yeah. so that and that's just, and it makes sense to me. Okay, so let's talk about um, man. This is you know every time I talk to people when we get into this a little deeper, I just realize just how much of a, a stop sign we're looking at. Let's talk about the potential, you know, ramps that are coming into the space. You look at Fidelity, Bank of America is now in direct exposure to Bitcoin through MicroStrategy. There's a lot of people. And I should say people, institutional, that are starting to move in this direction. Fidelity uh, doing a ton of research. You can get Bitcoin, ETH, ETH over there yes. today. You, can't act, you, can, you can only buy and sell it there. But uh, the point is, is that it's, it's a new on-ramp. That's good. Uh, but at the same time, you've got you know situations like Coinbase saying, oh, well, all right, well, we're not really sure what's going to happen. So we're going to kind of hedge our bet and we're going to go offshore and set up an international exchange. 
So you've got that scenario playing into it. Uh, you've got an, a UAE uh, infrastructure being built here for crypto, more business mm-hmm. friendly. I mean, how do you see this playing out? Because we're, we're going to have an event that's coming to us very soon to a theater near you where there's going to be a lot of people coming into Bitcoin. Right. Where is going to be, and that's going to create a new power yeah. center. Whoever is there at that time in place is going to be a, a power center, much like Binance got a benefit of Web3 and kind of that growth and explosion we had in this last run, which is what put Binance kind of up on the top. Now you've got maybe a new play here for Fidelity, maybe for Coinbase or other institutionals, maybe JP Morgan or others that might just say, hey, let's flip the switch and do a Fidelity. What do you think is going to happen in terms of who is the onboarding king this next mm-hmm. cycle? Yeah, I'm interested to see. I mean, the problem is institutions have not, they, they just have not embraced Bitcoin in particular as yeah. a separate asset class. They keep, they, they keep lumping it in with all the cryptos. And but so what I see happening, Paul, is over this next year and during this cycle, the, the knowledge and understanding of Bitcoin expanding exponentially. And so what, we're, what, what, what I'm watching is the people who need it so desperately in Lebanon or Venezuela or Argentina, right. and they need a place to store their value that, that they've their hard work that they've their energy that they've expended that now comes back to them in a money that's debasing so rapidly that they that and they can't even get access to it. So what are they doing? They're buying Bitcoin. It's it's the same volatility, but the volatility is up in the long term versus the mm-hmm. volatility of their oh, own zero. currency, zero. which is going to zero with huge volatility. So which would you rather? It's a no brainer. So as you get more and more people into the ecosystem and using Bitcoin like that, it just it it it, it just snowballs and it becomes that adoption curve that we saw that Fidelity is the one who actually uh, uh, published this last year, the, the adoption curve they expect to wrap up, you know, ramp up rapidly. And so it, will it be Fidelity? I don't know. It could be Apple that that decides that they're going to put Bitcoin in their <laughs> treasury. You know, yeah. I have no idea where it comes from. But what happens, I believe, is that you just get enough people that are using it and enough of a, a, do, a dollar value. It still needs look. Bitcoin still needs another zero on the end of it on its market value in yeah. order to be for it to be large enough and liquid enough for these institutions to really take it seriously. It's still a tiny, tiny, tiny asset ac- across the whole world. So, but it grows organically, and then when they do adopt it, there's going to be no choice. You've yeah. got basically yeah. five institutions that that uh, control thirty trillion dollars of wealth, right? So between Insane. BlackRock Insane. and Fidelity and State Street and Morgan Stanley and and UBS, they control thirty trillion dollars. One of them, if just one of them says that they can they they consider bitcoin a separate asset class and they're going to get a one two three percent position in it everybody has so, to follow suit there's just yeah. yeah at that at that point the the cycle is in and at that point mm-hmm. bitcoin has uh has gone mainstream essentially and it becomes a you know the level of a gold level asset which is you know 12 trillion right now in, in terms of the gold market cap Last question to you is CBDC. I just want to go to this article. This is the BIS uh, issues a comprehensive paper on offline CBDC payments. They hit on a few Mm -hmm. things, mainly around privacy and fraud, but um, they're actively exploring opportunities for offline payments involving central banks for a CBDC. Now, we've talked about CBDCs. This is the Polaris project. and, and you think about what's happening on a global perspective. You look at the alternative to a global reserve. You look at where Bitcoin is going, where blockchain is going in general. How does, how does a CBDC truly play out in the Western economies? You know, we know how it's happening over here in China with the digital yuan right now. But what about in the Western economies, the UK, the European zone, Canada, U- U.S.? Yeah, I think that it's it, it's going to be a shorter putt for Europe to introduce a CBDC. Uh, they it's a much much more uh, it's a much they're much closer to a social democracy than than we are. You know, yeah. closer to that socialism where they it, it's going to be easier for them to implement it. Uh, I think it's going to be much more difficult here, truly. But the you know the playbook for the for the uh, for the government for the treasury for 
for them to introduce this is to start introducing payments to people and and you know some sort of of uh minimum payment to people that uh that allows them to to convince people that it's a good thing it's just a digital form of the dollar and so once you do that it's going to make it very it's going to it's going to make it difficult to fight against but i do believe that here in the united states there are enough people who see this and are aware of it that uh, they 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 want to protect their freedom, and right. they understand that this is inherently uh, impeding their freedom because of the controls, because of the oversight, and it's just uh, it's it, I, I believe that there's going to be enough pushback and enough gridlock in Washington that it'll take a long time. So, yeah. well, you have you know, fortunately, where we are, Florida. Uh, you have Governor DeSantis coming in and basically he's officially banned central bank yes. digital currencies to be in the state. So I think those kind of activities in a republic, a true republic, which is quite a bit different than any other entity in the world uh, in terms of its governmental structure uh, of how states work, I think a lot of people forget that is that uh, we are a republic and, and it does change yeah. a lot of the dynamics of how politics works here in the U.S. So it's going to be fun, fun to watch. For sure. I agree. James I Lavish, agree. it's been great having you on. I'm, I'm so sad that we haven't had you on before, but you you have a welcome mat here at our show. Anytime you feel like you, you got something heavy to say, we'd love to have you back. If you guys are not following James, jump over to his Twitter right here. You can also catch him at jameslavish.com and, of course, the Bitcoin Opportunity Fund. But give him a follow over on Twitter at least and tell him we sent you. Anyway, great having you well, on the show today. We appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, it was, it, was it was a pleasure, Paul. Thank you for having me, and I look forward to the next time. Excellent. Okay. All right, you guys are tuned in over on the podcast side of things right now. Jump over here to the YouTube channel and subscribe. It's one of the best ways for us to not only connect with you, our audience, but also it's where we also drop additional content, and that is through our thing called the Diamond Circle. It's very easy. Click the link down below. We just put out a big uh, you know, forecast uh, this yeah, it was, it was uh, this morning, and we dropped it, and it's only available to our Diamond Circle members, so get in there. At least you can get to that over on our Substack. And, of course, if you want to reach me, it's out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.